Chapter 10 of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Steel Sharks. The sun was a shimmering ball of brass that seemed to hang motionless in the high heavens forever and ever. At least it seemed forever to Dawson and Farmer, huddled down in the small rubber life raft that rose and fell with maddening monotonous regularity under the urging of the long rolling swells of the southwest Pacific. Brassy sun on high, all about them, and even dancing up off the waters, straight into their eyes. Oh, for a shack about six miles this side of the North Pole, Dave groaned, and licked his cracked lips. What I wouldn't give for a spot like that right now. Yes, quite, Freddy answered listlessly. And, of course, during the six months of night they have up there, you know, Dave, I... I say, look, look, Dave, to starboard, way out where the blasted sky meets the blasted water. Do you see something? For a couple of moments Dawson refused to turn his head. It seemed as though he had spent his entire life in this raft, squinting hopefully at imagined objects, only to be slapped in his burning, stinging face by lost hope. For twenty-six heart-crushing long hours, Freddy and he had been floating about in the raft on the crest of the southwest Pacific. Twelve of those hours had been spent in the darkness of night, hoping, hoping, hoping that dawn's light would bring them a sight of one of their own planes, or of one of the task force ships. Just to see something besides sky, water, and darkness would have been something, even if it hadn't meant rescue for them. But it had been only sky, water, and darkness, then sky and water again, and a blast furnace sun that seemed to pierce the top of their heads and burn their brains to a crisp. Presently Dawson did turn his head, cup his hands to his tired eyes, and peer in the direction Freddy Farmer was pointing. At first he saw absolutely nothing. Then suddenly his heart leaped high in his chest. There was something way out there, something on the surface of the water or just over it. He couldn't tell for sure, and he definitely couldn't even guess at what it might be. The dazzling rays of the sun, dancing up off the surface of the water, were like hot needle points that drew blood in his eyes. But there was something way out there on the horizon. Yes, definitely something. But did it mean life or death? That last question pounded around and around inside Dave's head as he strained his eyes at the distant horizon. Do you see it, Dave? Freddy Farmer's voice broke into his thoughts. Yes, I see it. But what? He replied. A ship, a plane, or maybe just some kind of bird. My guess is a submarine, Freddy said. Then an instant later, he exclaimed, Yes, I'm sure of it. I could make out the conning tower. Good grief, Dave. It's a Nazi U-boat. Huh? Dave gasped, and sat up so violently that he rocked the raft. You're nuts, Freddy. This is the Pacific, not the Atlantic. That may be, the English youth shot right back at him. But that thing out there is a Nazi U-boat. Or I never saw one. See, it's coming toward us now. It must have sighted us. Nuts again, Dave replied. We'd only be a speck at that distance, even in glasses. It just happens that it's headed our way. Freddy shrugged and made a little gesture with one hand. Have it your own way, old thing, he said. It's heading right for us just the same. And if they haven't sighted us, they certainly will soon. There, see, Dave? Men are climbing out of the conning tower hatch onto the deck. Yes, I see, Dave replied gloomily which means they must be pretty sure they've got this neck of the woods all to themselves. I wonder just how far we've drifted in twenty-six hours. I wonder where the Carson is, and how the others made out. I, oh nuts, what good does it do to wander about anything right now? Heck, we couldn't change anything anyway. That confounded seaplane and the rats in her. Boy, does that burn me up. I could kick myself all over this here Pacific Ocean. 
Easy, old chap, Freddy said gently. Don't let it get you down so, Dave. Good grief. What else could you have done? Plenty, Dawson said, with an angry nod of his head. I could have kept my eye on the ball, for one thing, and not let them get so close they could cut in with a few snap bursts. But no, I had to fall like a ton of bricks for that moss-covered trick of getting a guy to look the other way when you're about to slug him. So help me. I'll feel like a chump for that if I live to be a million. Well, go ahead then, Freddy said in exasperation. But you're definitely silly to feel as you do. Besides, what does it matter now? There's a U-boat coming toward us, and they certainly see us now. Dave looked and saw the U-boat, now less than a mile away. Too bad we didn't strip off one of your guns and take it with us, Freddy, he said. With a machine gun, we could dust off quite a few of those apes on the deck there. And hey, what gives now? That's a U-boat, sure enough, Freddy. But those guys on the deck aren't Jerry's. They're Japs, what I mean. Yes, I know, the English youth replied, which proves the rumors that I've heard that Hitler has loaned some of his U-boats to the Japs, some of his old ones. Well, that one's not old, Dave declared, and stared hard at the approaching undersea craft. That's a new one, or I'll eat my shirt. That's a big baby, Freddy, very big. If it wasn't for the conning tower, you'd almost take it for a destroyer. No wonder we could spot it way over the horizon. And, oh, oh, and how they spot us. Look at the rats. The last was caused by quick movements on the bow deck of the approaching U-boat. A machine gun had been set up, and the man behind it was training the gun on the floating raft. For a couple of seconds, Dave's heart came up to jam hard against his back teeth, and he half expected to see fire spurt out from the muzzle of the machine gun, and to feel the hot sting of bullets biting into his flesh. The gun did not fire, however, and presently the U-boat was practically on top of the raft. Dark blue-garbed Japs seemed to be swarming all over the place, and Dave's hatred for them mounted to a white fury as he watched them agate-eyed. Then suddenly the head and shoulders of a bull-necked officer of the Nazi Navy appeared up out of the conning tower hatch. He put a small megaphone to his lips and bellowed the words across the water. Make any effort to resist, and you will be killed where you are, he thundered. Be sensible. We are taking you aboard. I warn you to keep your hands in sight. The man spoke almost perfect English, and the boys blinked in surprise. Yes, I would, if I only had a machine gun, Dave grated under his breath. Nothing I'd like better than to knock you and your little brown pals kicking. Shut up, Dave, Freddy ordered him. Stop trying to play, blasted soldier. You know perfectly well you wouldn't shoot, even if you did have a gun. You'd be too thankful for the chance to get out of this raft, just as you are now, and you know it. Okay, okay, let me up. I'm all cut, Dave grunted at him. Just the same, pal. I never did care much for U-boat rides. Well, I'm afraid we have no choice in the matter, old thing, Freddy sighed, and let the subject drop. The U-boat was close to the bobbing raft now. And just as a matter of precaution, both Dave and Freddy made very sure that they kept their hands in full view of all those aboard the undersea craft. The two Japs behind the deck-mounted machine gun leered at them over the bead sight, and it was easy to see they wouldn't mind at all in order to pull the trigger. No such order was given, however, and a couple of moments later, one of the Jap sailors caught hold of the raft with a boat hook, pulled it close, and the two youths clambered up onto the wet deck of the U-boat. No sooner had they climbed up on deck then a couple of Jap Navy officers moved in on them quickly and searched for weapons. They found none and were obviously disappointed. Then a shrill order in sing-song Japanese snapped the look of disappointment from their slant-eyed faces. They grunted at the two boys and then nodded toward the conning tower bridge. 
where the Nazi commander of the craft stood waiting. They went over and up the short companion ladder, with a couple of Japs sticking conveniently at their heels. They halted in front of the bull-necked German, who eyed them as though he had never seen a couple of white men in his life, which of course was quite possible, in view of the fact that he was of German birth. Then suddenly he exploded in a booming voice that almost blew the boys over. What's the name of your carrier, he thundered, and how long ago were you shot down? Dawson hesitated a moment, and then let him have it, in a very meek and humble voice, too. We weren't assigned to any special carrier, sir, he said. We flew off any one of the five of them, and we've been in the water for about a week now. No, call it an even eight days. The Nazi's eyes widened, and he blinked them hard. What's this, he cried. But before he could get his breath to say anything else, one of the Jap naval officers stepped forward. He lies, Commandant, he said in perfect German. All American pigs lie. The United States have not five carriers left in all their navy. Besides, we know these two were shot down by our plane yesterday. The two words, our plane, had all the effect on Dawson of a swift punch in the jaw. Impulsively, he raced his eyes along the length of the U-boat, and particularly the forward end. It was then that he spotted telltale objects that told him the truth, and cleared up a little of the mystery of yesterday's meeting in the air with that strange seaplane. In short, he saw a plane hoist secured to the port side of the forward deck. It was fastened down in a horizontal position, but it could be raised upright at a moment's notice. He also saw that just about the entire forward deck consisted of two hatch covers that could be folded back to make a good-sized opening in the deck. And although he could not look down through the steel plates to what was below, he had the very definite feeling that stowed neatly in the forward hold of the U-boat was that strange type of seaplane with its wings folded back. Airplane-carrying submarines were nothing new to Dawson or to Freddy Farmer, either. But it was a bit of a shock to realize that they had been shot down by such a craft, and also that they had been rescued by the mother U-boat of the plane. "'Yes, yes, I know,' Dawson heard the Nazi commander grunt impatiently at the Jap. "'Of course our plane shot them down. But you do not know these American dogs as I do.' Let them lie long enough, and before they realize it, they are telling you the truth. You will see what I mean. We'll take them to my quarters and wait. This is a bad hour to remain on the surface too long. We will submerge at once. The Nazi had spoken in German, and both Dawson and Freddy Farmer understood him perfectly. However, they were very careful not to let that fact show in their faces. As a matter of fact, they stared puzzle-eyed at the Nazi, and then looked inquiringly at each other. The Nazi saw them do that and laughed harshly. "'Do not worry, swine,' he spoke in harsh English. "'When the Führer is in your White House, all you American dogs will be taught to speak German. There will be but one language, then, German.' The Nazi nodded violently and then snapped a glittering eye at the Jap naval officer as though inviting him to take issue with his words. The Jap, however, refused to take issue. He simply smiled politely and then motioned for Dave and Freddy to climb up over the lip of the conning tower hatch and start down inside the boat. When they reached the bottom of the conning tower ladder, which ended in the central control room and nerve center of the U-boat, the Jap did not give them so much as half a chance to look around. He had his gun out then, and he jabbed them both hard in the back and pointed aft. The pain from the jab made firecrackers go off in Dave's brain, and for one crazy instant he was tempted to wheel round and drive both fists into that slant-eyed, hateful face. Common sense, however, came to his rescue instantly, and he checked the urge and went stumbling along in step with Freddy Farmer. When they were about halfway aft, along the narrow companionway, 
The Jap halted and more or less pushed and shoved them into a fairly good-sized cabin. The 101 different smells of the inside of a submarine were just as heavy and noticeable there as they had been in the control room. However, Dawson could not help gasping impulsively at the luxuriousness of the fittings and furnishings. He had been in other Nazi U-boats, but never in one in which the commander had fitted himself out so proudly as this one. For a second he wondered if the Nazis had been forced to doll up their U-boats to get commanders and crews to take them out on their hazardous voyages. On second thought, though, he decided that all this was simply a Nazi touch to impress their comrades in cold murder, the Japanese. Just the same, the cabin was certainly well appointed, and Dave secretly hoped the Nazi would question them for quite some time, so that he would have a good chance to relax and get a lot of the salt water and sun stiffness out of his joints. But he experienced a very rude awakening, even as he was expressing that hope to himself and starting to sit down in one of the fancy chairs. The Jap's gun came out fast and cracked him hard on the side of the head. Dog, the slant-eyed one screamed, how dare you seat yourself in the presence of an officer of the Imperial Japanese Navy? Stand on your feet, over there by the door, move a muscle, and I will take greatest pleasure in shooting you. With a tremendous effort, Dawson forced back the surging, blazing anger that rose up in his throat to choke him. Then he joined Freddy by the door and stood there, with his gaze fixed hard and unwinking on the Jap. The little brown rat sneered and leered and tried to stare Dawson down. He didn't even get the first base, though, and presently it was he who lowered his eyes. And so that was the picture, as there came clanking sounds and roared out orders from various directions inside the U-boat. A moment later, the craft trembled and shook from end to end, and Dave felt the deck under his feet slant as the craft dived and went under water. Three, four, five minutes ticked by, and then the Nazi commander pushed through the door inside. He seemed surprised to see Dawson and Farmer standing stiff as a couple of wooden Indians by the door. He glanced sharply at the Jap and made sounds under his breath. Then he went over and dropped his big frame into a chair and sat regarding the two youths out of wide-set eyes that held nothing but the look of death in them. End of Chapter 10